introduce our guest speaker, Lisa Wood Shapiro, was shaped by the challenges associated with her dyslexia. She's always been drawn to storytelling, first as a television producer and now as a contributor to Vogue, Wired, and Outside Magazine. She wrote the memoir Hot Mess Mom and is currently finishing her first novel. She's a graduate of NYU's film school. She gained national attention for her recent article in Wired magazine about how technology helped her cheat dyslexia. Technology, it's fair to say, is her friend. She's the mother of three children, one who is also a unique learner. Lisa feels a connection to the Groves community. So ladies and gentlemen, please be prepared to be inspired by Lisa Wood Shapiro. Um, I'm honored here to be here, be here tonight. And um, this is my first time in Minnesota, and you're all so nice. And I don't know if it's because I'm from Brooklyn or if we have to work on our cell. Anyway, but um, everybody, like the, the Lyft driver who I couldn't meet, and then she picked me up, and she was like, that's all right. Anyway, it was just, <laughs> everybody's nice, but why I'm here. Um, I met many of your children yesterday at Groves Academy, and they shared their own struggles with learning and how their lives had changed for the better since attending Groves. What they had, say, had to say was both moving and at times profound, and what a wonderful school. I'm so impressed. I was asked to come here tonight because last year I wrote a piece for Wired called The End of Dyslexia. I wrote about being diagnosed in second grade and how I spent years in rigorous instruction and summer school using some very old techniques to learn to read. But I'm not that old, but I used old techniques. But. For the piece, I had my brain scanned. I took a reading test using eye scanning technology and wrote about the ways Grammarly, a writing software backed with some serious machine learning, somehow knew my unique dyslexic misspellings. Better than any spell check I had ever used, Grammarly got me. I wrote about how technology will deliver a post-dyslexic world. And lastly, I wrote about how I hid the fact that I had dyslexia because I make my living as a writer. It was the toughest piece I'd ever written, more difficult than the memoir on new motherhood, more revealing than my adventures in online dating, riskier than taking ayahuasca, the psychedelic drug, and more confessional than the time I took my three children on a bittersweet trip into the woods to a sporting camp right after they learned I was getting a divorce. Yes, writing about how I saw words was the most personal of them all. The day it went live, I wondered if it would be my last assignment. We live in the age of the Googled life. There was no going back. And would it make that tangible connection, the bond between writer and reader? My story would be shared thousands of times, picked up on other platforms and outlets, and emails filled my inbox. Readers shared their private memories pain, triumphs, their life stories, sometimes 600, 800, 1200 words long. I had to put a disclaimer on my website that I was overwhelmed and would try and read and answer everyone's email and everyone that connected me with me might hear back from me, but it would take time. Mothers asked if I could call their children. Others asked if I could reach out to their adult sons and daughters. Wives told me that their doubting husbands now believe dyslexia was real. I mean, there are people like that. Men and women a generation older told me about their unmet needs in schools ill-equipped to deal with their unique learning. And I felt very much like the receiver of memory and Lois Laura is the giver. Lois Laurie is the giver. I don't have to tell you this thing, how we see words, it goes deep. I found readers in the most unexpected places. Last fall, as I was being wheeled into the operating room for emergency surgery, a doctor looked down at me and with a big smile, she said, I'm dyslexic too. <laughs> I didn't say this then, but at that moment, all I thought was, 
I hope you know your left from your right better than I do. <laughs> See, I can make all the dyslexic jokes. Um, I, don't also, I, I, don't, I also don't have to tell you that dyslexia is highly heritable. And it was my middle child that would be my unique learner. When he was four, I toured schools all over New York City in search of an appropriate placement. I remember one ha headmaster telling us anxious parents, your kids are lucky, you're here. And I could say the same thing to all of you tonight, your kids are lucky, they're at Groves. <laughs> and then he said, I hate to tell you all this, but life is gonna be harder for your kids. They will work harder. I didn't want my son to experience what I went through, and I kept asking his teachers and therapists the same question, when is he going to catch up? That morning, the headmaster answered it. It's not that they're behind on the path. They took a completely different road. I left the school in a funk. What I longed for, what I wanted to know was how does his story end? I confess, I also suffer from America's fascination, obsession really, with early achievement. Our own spin on the hero's journey, the prodigy. This country loves a Mozart. It makes for a great segment on 60 Minutes, the young athlete, the tiny polygot, the toddler reader, their glossy profiles write themselves. And this infatuation with the young genius who picks up reading, music, or math with ease carries over into our other narratives. The reverence for the baby-faced tech founders, the pint-sized Olympians, the age of genius in America's infancy. And what's lost is that other narrative, the one where a hero builds mastery over time. And so to embrace the dyslexic child is to embrace the hero's journey, that of Odysseus, Katniss Everdeen, Harry Potter. But I hadn't arrived there yet. I wanted things to be easy for my kids. I've since changed my mind, but. Um, in writing The Wired Story, I visited Dr. Guinevere Eden, who's the director of the Center for Study of Learning at Georgetown University. There, I had my brain scanned by a functional magnetic imaging machine while I read text. I think I told her, like, well, it's not gonna look dyslexic, because I outgrew it, it was totally dyslexic. It was like completely dyslexic brain. And I actually didn't want to have it in Wired, but that wouldn't be journalistically ethical. But. Um, Dr. Eden gives the test to participants in her brain study for activity to dyslexics both before and after intensive intervention. She discovered that through intervention, the dyslexic brain showed activity um, in areas that weren't activated before. She explained how reading is a relatively new activity for humans. From an evolutionary perspective, our brains were not designed to read. Reading hijacks an area of the brain where we identify objects. To put that in context, when I did a story of psychedelics for Vogue, I learned that we have receptors in our brain for DMT. Our brains co-evolved to take psychedelics. Not, not really for reading, but. Reading is maybe 6,000 years old. For the general population at large, a few hundred years. There is no quick fix or cure for dyslexia though um, people did reach out to me to cure me after the piece came out, they, I didn't do it. As Dr. Eden's study proved, to rewire the dyslexic brain is to have hard, intense, intense instruction over long hours. What if this is exactly what the worker of the future needed to succeed in the new economy? What if it wasn't a burden, but a built-in obstacle course of the mind? What if it is what Cal Newport calls in his fabulous book, Deep Work, just that, Deep Work? And deep work focuses on working without the internet, iPhone distraction, and this applies to the way dyslexic children have to focus to learn to read. Perhaps knowing that they can do this kind of work will stay with them as adults. What if in doing this work that is slow going, at times tedious, also builds endurance? What if knowing a hard truth early on was a good thing? And what if it revealed another necessary tool for success, a growth mindset? Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, lays out the traits of both the fixed and growth mindset and why those with a growth mindset are positioned for success. The fixed mindset embraces the myth of the instantly good, the prodigy phenomenon. Those with a fixed mindset will assume, after trying and failing at something, that they weren't meant to do it. 
while those with a growth mindset surrender to the idea that while they may not be good at something right away, a new skill, a new sport, writing code, they have the option to work at it, gaining mastery over time. Dyslexia is a catapult for that thinking. Recently, I was listening to Shane Parrish's brilliant podcast, The Knowledge Project, and his guest was Toby Lutke, co-founder and CEO of Shopify, the most popular shopping cart system for e-commerce industry. And to know how influential Shopify is, every 70 seconds, someone with a new online sale, store makes their first sale. Shopify has made entrepreneurs of hundreds of thousands of people. And as the interview progresses, Toby says, everything at Shopify is built around the idea that if someone shows up with a fixed mindset, we convert them to a growth mindset quickly. And my br blink response was, this dude's dyslexic. <laughs> Finally, what, it's like a game I play now, okay. Finally, <laughs> when asked what he's reading, Toby says, well, I'm dyslexic, so it takes me a long time, and I thought I knew it. And he went on to say something else that I love, and it was about this view of failure. He referred to it as the discovery of things that didn't work out. And I mean, that is so beautifully dyslexic. I mean, it's just, only a dyslexic would say something so genius. Anyway, I hope you don't think it's a rotten thing to tell a child, this is gonna be harder for you. You're gonna learn how to stretch your brain. You're rewiring it with this intensive work, hopefully in the ideal setting of a small class like Groves where you have to focus on this thing that perhaps humans weren't even designed to do. But trust me, while the owl didn't come to your window with a letter inviting you to Hogwarts, you've been invited to join a club of smart kids who think creatively, and you're going to learn how to do hard work. The book, The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday has a huge following among NFL coaches, like the Vikings, and players, the NBA, athletes, tech leaders, but I claim this book for us. It is about lessons one can learn from the Stoics, and the title is Holiday's Take on a line from Marcus Aurelius, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. The book highlights many stories of, his, stories of historical figures in politics, sports, literature, and science that proceed not in spite of their challenges, but in many cases because of it. They overcome horrendous odds with grit, sometimes cheerful grit. There's a moment in the book, and like all the books I mentioned, I've listened to this on Audible, where he highlights those who have overcome great odds against racism, sexism, poverty, and in the middle of this list he says, and the dyslexics. And this was right around the time I pitched the story to Wired, and I gave myself permission to acknowledge that I had this thing. And if you break it down, my dyslexia was the impediment. It was the obstacle in my early school career. But as a writer, when I faced it, I wrote about it. Well, I, got, I went viral, but um, it was truly the way. I'm not even sure I would be a writer if I wasn't dyslexic because I wanted so badly to conquer this thing. We also are in the midst of a parenting crisis. We've gone from helicopter parents to the bulldozer parent who attempts to clear the child's path of all obstacles. I know a few bulldozer parents, as I'm sure you do. And the recent college cheating scandal highlights this in the extreme. It is impossible to remove the obstacles for the dyslexic child. And while parents are advocates finding the right school, the right setting, we have no choice but to let our child overcome the challenge of reading. They have to face adversity at an early age. And learning to read, they have found their way. When your children graduate from college or vocational school, they will enter a very different playing field for dyslexics than before, ever before. I mean, there has never been a better time to be dyslexic, have ADHD, autism, be on the spectrum, and what is happening now is unprecedented. Tech, recruiters, the quest for a neurodiverse office is at an inflection point. Prominent companies have reformed their HR process in order to access neurodiverse talent. Companies like Hewlett Packer, Microsoft, Ford, and many others like Dell, JP Morgan Chase, IBM have efforts on the way and are eliminating bias from the recruiting process. No longer is the talented autistic worker stymied by a lack of interview skills. The dyslexic worker has writing assistant software, dictation to tech software, accessibility tech is a growth market, 
and companies like Microsoft and IBM take it very seriously. And while we are in the early days, the strides in software development and recruiting for the neurodiverse office of the future are exponential. Those who walk the path without obstacles, who lack grit, possess a fixed mindset, and possibly do not, not, do not know the value of deep work, they might struggle in the new economy. But the dyslexic who is armed with a growth mindset and knows hard work, they might be better than all right. I can't tell you how the story ends for your child or for mine, but I do know this. The hero is dyslexic. So anyway, thank you.